in, indeed, thanks for coming out on this rainy night. We turned on the weather forecast and said it rained inches and inches out there. Um, and thanks for C-SPAN for coming too. Um, I uh, exactly one week ago to, uh, today was, of course, the 50th anniversary of Sputnik, the the uh, first satellite to orbit the Earth. And I wanted to begin just by reading the beginning of a chapter, which is. Um, what happened to von Braun on the night that, that, that Sputnik was announced. Late on the afternoon of Friday, 4 October 1957, just 15 years and one day after the first successful V-2 launch in Peenemünde, Werner von Braun went back to his Huntsville office. There was to be a brief interlude before cocktails and dinner at the officers' club. Together with General Medeiros, he had been showing the newly nominated Defense Secretary, Neil McElroy, and Army Secretary Brooker around Redstone Arsenal all day. The phone, telephone rang. It was a British newspaper man calling from New York. What do you think of it? He asked. Think of what? The Russian satellite, the one they just orbited. I wasn't surprised, von Braun later said. I'd long known that the Russians had a satellite capability. I was just disappointed and a little bitter that we hadn't been allowed to do it before they did. When von Braun reached the party, he sought out McElroy and Medeiros. As he recalled the moment a few months later, he exclaimed, if you go back to Washington tomorrow, Mr. Secretary, and find that all hell has broken loose, remember this, we can get up a satellite in 60 days. Medeiros' 1960 memoir is more dramatic, based it is on a surprise announcement by his public relations chief, Gordon Harris, who was not even at the party. Perhaps the bearer of bad news was von Braun himself. There was a moment of stunned silence. Then von Braun began to talk as if he'd been suddenly been vaccinated with a Victrola needle. In his driving urgency to unburden his feelings, his words tumbled over one another. We knew they were going to do it. Vanguard will never make it. We have the hardware on the shelf. For God's sake, turn us loose and let us do something. We can put up a satellite in 60 days, Mr. McElroy. Just give us a green light and 60 days. Medeiros finally interjected, no, Werner, 90 days. The launch of Sputnik, Russian for satellite or fellow traveler, was one of the defining moments in Werner von Braun's life and one of his greatest disappointments. It stirred in him a boiling mix of emotions, frustration at two years of official setbacks for his satellite project, annoyance and depression at the propaganda harvest reaped by Khrushchev, jubilation at the prospect of finally being released from restraints, and hope that Sputnik would shock the United States into pursuing an energetic space program. Quite suddenly, the space age, as the press almost instantly dubbed it, had dawned, and von Braun was its prophet. Within four months after the launch of the first U.S. satellite, he was a bona fide American hero, the Western world's most prominent gladiator in a celestial contest with the Soviets. Now, of course, this fame was rather extraordinary because, of course, he was an ex-Nazi. He had come here from Germany. He had worked for the Third Reich. And, uh, and, and then he became a very, very famous American. And so I guess the, one of the questions of this book is, how is this possible? How is that this former member of, of the Nazi party, how could he have become such a famous American? What role did he play in the United States? And to do that, of course, we sort of need to go back to the beginning and understand who he was and how he, how he became a, uh, a, a, an important person in Germany first. Now, his background was... Uh, was pure Prussian uh, Junker, uh, uh, Eastern European aristocracy. He was actually a baron. He was born in 1912. He inherited the title of baron. Uh, he was, grew up in a very conservative nationalistic family, uh, sort of a very traditional Prussian aristocracy. Uh, many of his relatives had been army officers. Uh, his grandfather, his uncles, his father had been a reserve officer, a very typical thing, of course, for the Prussian aristocracy. Uh, he had been raised in this very traditional family, yet somehow in his, not in, in his uh, middle years of his childhood, he became a spaceflight fanatic, and he ended up doing something very unusual for a member of his class, becoming an engineer and a, tech, and a technical person. Uh, the spaceflight obsession that really drove him throughout his life was something that he developed between the ages of 14 and 16, therefore in the mid-1920s. Um, he just, this was the moment in which new ideas of the feasibility of space travel had been published by a few theoreticians. Uh, 
uh, in the German-speaking world, Hermann Obert was very important for establishing that rockets really could carry things into space, that we could build this technology, that it wasn't just a fantasy, it wasn't just science fiction. Maybe it was a few decades away, but it seemed to be coming soon. And of course, for a teenager who was already very interested in astronomy, this idea of traveling in space was, was, was fascinating. Uh, and he soon developed an, um, an incredible ambition. I guess this was part of, certainly part of his in, innate personality the way that he that he's motivated himself is that he decided he had to have a life's work and that he would have an enormous ambition and his enormous ambition by the age of 16 was to land on the moon to actually go into space to lead a space expedition he said to the New Yorker in 1951 a very fa a fascinating profile that I feature at the beginning of the book in the prologue he said, you know, I read this article in an astronomy magazine about an imaginary trip to the moon. It filled me with romantic urge, not just to stare at the moon and the planets, but to actually go there. I knew how Columbus had felt, he said. And so he, he had this, uh, this incredible ambition. And of course, you have to remember, this is 1928, and he's thinking about expeditions into space and leading an expedition into space. And that motivated him, because he'd been a very kind of indifferent student or a lazy student in some ways, motivated him to study his worst subjects, which happened to be math and physics, mostly because he just hadn't been, been interested before. But now he was fascinated with that and very r rapidly developed into a kind of prodigy, although a late prodigy, only at the very kind of end of his high school years and he, uh, he had been in uh, boarding school because his parents had to ship him off because regular education just didn't work for him. Now, he, you know, I think some point at this time in the late 20s of the, or the beginning of the 30s, I think he really must have discovered himself that, that he had this incredible, not just ambition, but also this incredible talent for winning people over. He was just astoundingly charismatic. I and mean, these people who have met him personally told me that too, and it's repeated over over time. It's hard to explain, but he was incredibly charming. Uh, he was very he was he was he, he could be completely down to earth, or he'd be extremely uh, cultured and polite. Uh, he was incredibly good looking. Uh, he was a golden boy. You know, he was one of these golden youths who looked wonderful, and everything came easy to him. Um, he, uh, you know, he was, he, he, in the 1930s, when, by the time he was in his 20s, he certainly became quite a, a ladies' man, uh, or, or if, you, if you prefer, a womanizer. But certainly, he was extremely successful with the opposite sex. And there are two descriptions of him from after World War II by British correspondents that stick in my mind. One of them described him right after the end of the war, as a blue-eyed, blonde, the Nazi artist picture of the perfect Aryan man. And another, a couple years later, described him as handsome as a film star and he knows it. So, uh, so you know, he had this winning way, this, this, this charisma, he had, he had the drive, he also had the ability, so that uh, in, in maths and sciences, uh, and this led him on very rapidly into a career from rather under small beginnings. In 1932, when he was still a student and working for a small uh, amateur rocket group in Berlin, the army came looking at what this amateur rocket group was doing, wasn't very interested in what they had accomplished, wasn't very impressed, but they were impressed by Werner von Braun. He was, he was obviously talented obviously had the prospect for the future and they they sort of asked him towards the end of 1932 and of course you remember this is before Hitler comes to power just before it's in the context of catastrophic political conditions in Germany massive unemployment street battles between the Nazis and the communists the government was unstable and in fact his father in this very last two governments before Hitler came to power was the minister of agriculture for, for, for Germany uh, in these last reactionary cabinets before Hitler came to power, the army said, come over to us, we'll uh, finance your dissertation research, we'll move you into physics at the University of Berlin, and we'll finance your uh, secret rocket work if you just come and work for us. And that sounded like a pretty, it was a very good deal to him. He said, at least with hindsight, he said, but perhaps at the time, you know, I knew very well that the amateur rocket business was just t making toys and 
the only real hope for future large-scale rocketry for spaceflight was going with the military, going with the Army. For the family, I think being hired by the Army was in fact a great asset because it legitimized what seemed like a rather flaky, you know, uh, crackpot almost act, uh, enthusiasm that he had for this technology, although his mother had been very encouraging. His father was just kind of mystified by it all. Um, but uh, the Army legitimized for him, for the relatives, his working in rocketry. And then right after that happened, Hitler came to power. Two months after he started with the Army, and Jan at the end of January 33, Hitler came into power. And then, you know, of course, it wasn't an instantaneous change, but within a few months, they had the Nazis had successfully subverted the Constitution and destroyed the other parties. And, you know, as far as I can tell, von Braun was really indifferent to all this. He said at the time, he didn't really notice anything about it, uh, except that his father lost his job. His father was out of the job as agriculture minister when the Hitler cabinet came in, and they had to move out of the minister's residence, but beyond that, he didn't seem to care. And I think part of this is that he was so obsessed with rocketry and space flight that that was the only thing he truly cared about. But he also came out of this conservative nationalist context, a conservative nationalist family, and, you know, for the, the, the Nazis started out one of the ways it consolidated power was by making an alliance with a conservative nationalist faction in Germany, um, in the aristocracy, in big business, in the army, and then proceeding and, and, and represented themselves as representing German values and then proceeded to shove those people out of the way once they could seize power solely for themselves. But uh, for von Braun, he was, in the, he was working for the army, at first just as a graduate student, but, but money started coming in, of course, Rearmament, first secretly on a small scale, then increasingly on a large scale, money came pouring in, and, and he was financed more and more. And he was also very successful, very small scale in the rocket development, but very rapidly it grew. And in fact, within five years, this is really astonishing, but within five years, you know, in the context of this massive rearmament buildup, the Army decided along with the Air Force to build a whole new rocket center on the Baltic coast at Peinemünde. And, and although he, had, he was only 25 years old in 1920, uh, 1937, he uh, was already in command of 400 people. Because he had this talent. I mean, this is where, in the context of building up this rocket program and then building up Peinemünde, you know, they, which itself grew by a factor of 10 or more over the next few years, he demonstrated that his fundamental talent was the management of huge technological groups of engineering management. As a scientist, as an engineer, he was no better than a lot of others, but as an engineering manager, he was spectacularly successful. And, you know, of course, one of the feature, features that this book makes much of is the Faustian bargain, because in effect, Von Braun kind of sleepwalked into a Faustian bargain with the Third Reich. And, 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 and almost more than many scientists and engineers of the 20th century, this Faustian bargain was absolutely the best metaphor for what happened to him. Because he, you know, the money was coming in, he had more power, he had more resources, his, his rocket program was building up, you know, the, the, the Nazi regime wasn't any problem for him. He, had him, he was getting in deeper and deeper, and then, of course, as time went on, combination of kind of seduction and pressure, he gets drawn deeper and deeper into the system and implicated more in, 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 the, in, the, in the system and ultimately in its crimes. First, in 1937, after they open Pena Mundo, they say, you know, join the party. You really need to join the party. You know, this is something you should Nazi party. It's something you really should do. He said, okay, you know, why not? I mean, I don't want to hurt my career. And then, three years later, in 1940, the SS says, well, the SS officer shows up in his office and says, Heinrich Himmler really wants you to join the SS. You know, you're a perfect candidate for it, and, and we really like you to have you do it. And in the end, he says, well, uh, you know, I guess I can't find a reason to say no. Uh, my, his military superior, General Dornberger, kind of told him he really needed to do it and he didn't want to risk, risk, risk his career, so he said, okay, I'll become an SS officer. So in 1940, he becomes a, a second lieutenant in the SS. Uh, the real, of course, the deeper, the, the most 
uh, incriminating compromises or, or pressures put upon him come in the course of the war. Because Peenemünde was uh, uh, developing a ballistic missile, the world's first ballistic missile, the V-2 as it's best known, uh, and which was deployed ultimately in 1944 against London and Antwerp. And the development of this ballistic missile gradually uh, as it, it developed larger into a program, they had to promise something. They had to promise that this rocket program was going to produce a weapon, that it was going to produce something. And, and it was therefore necessary to press it into production. But once, the, once it got into the production phase, 1943, they said, where are we going to get the workers? Somebody said, let's use concentration camp labor. Uh, in fact, one of his closest associates, Arthur Rudolph, whose name comes back at the end of the story, uh, went, saw concentration camp labor being used at an aircraft factory near Berlin and said, yes, that's a great idea. Let's use this concentration camp labor. Von Braun, I don't think at this point, was involved in that decision. But once they went underground in the August of 1943 and after, then it turned into a horrible catastrophe. Um, because after the air raid on Peenemünde in August 1943, they said, we have to evacuate rocket production of this super secret you know, wonder weapon that they're going to produce underground. They built a factory in the mine tunnels in central Germany near Nordhausen. And, the, uh, and, the, and these tunnels had to be finished. Uh, the mining conditions were a disaster. The uh, uh, concentration camp workers were housed underground. Uh, the living conditions were horrible, and thousands died over the winter of 1943-44. And von Braun had, was there. He, 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 he walked through those tunnels. He saw those conditions. He, talked, he addressed those prisoners directly in a few cases. He had direct encounter with these things. What could he have done about it? That's a, that remains, of course, a significant debate because, in fact, he did not have much power to change the, 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 the conditions of the prisoners. And if he disliked it, as he probably did, uh, it wasn't something that he felt he could do anything about. And what I think disturbed me more than anything else about this story is just the sense of him never wanting to take personal responsibility of any kind for it. I mean, of course, he had to explain himself late in life regarding his relationship to concentration camp workers but, and, and, and so forth. And he always seemed to uh, tr say, you know, I thought it was terrible, but I couldn't do anything. It was not in my control. There was never much sense that he really felt that he had any personal responsibility for this whatsoever. And it did not deter him from his course. I mean, he remained as fanatically energetic and committed to trying to bring the V2 into production, trying to bring it into deployment as, as ever. And he continued, and of course, just to make the story even more interesting and complicated, in, in March 44, he's himself arrested by the Gestapo and held in prison for 10 days because he made some drunken remarks at a party uh, in near Peenemünde about he'd he and two friends who were also arrested, that they'd, they really would rather have built a spaceship than, 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 than a weapon, and that, uh, that the war was lost. The war was turning out badly. And of course, in the Nazi Germany, to, to, to admit defeat, and admit the war was going badly, was in itself a crime. You could be executed just for saying that. Uh, nobody was allowed to, to even think that the war could be lost. Now, this arrest is interesting because it comes in the context also of something that happened a month before, which seems very likely to have something to do with it. One month previously, Himmler had called his office and, and asked for von Braun to show up. So von Braun flew out to East Prussia to see Himmler and Himmler said, why don't you come over to us? You know, the SS can give you much more support. We have the direct ear to the Fuhrer. Why don't you cooperate with us? And Christie, at this time, the SS was trying to grab a greater and greater role over the program. And of course, von Braun himself, although it wasn't really his choice, he was an SS officer. In fact, he'd been promoted to major by this time. Well, he said to Himmler, no, I don't think so. I mean, the army leadership I have, General Dornberger is the best superior I could have. No, thank you. We'll, we just have technical problems. We'll solve the technical problems. And so he gently rebuffed Himmler. And it seems likely that this, kind, this rebuff in, con, in conjunction with these 
these these these these uh, incautious remarks that he made uh, directly led to this arrest. He was rescued from the arrest by the efforts of General Dornberger and by the intervention of Albert Speer, the armaments minister, and he got out in uh, after about 10 days and was put on some kind of conditional arrest that later went away. But he was then in a very peculiar position. But it's my, uh, you know, just reading this and, and seeing some of the remarks that he made after the war, it's apparent that that's probably about the first time or certainly was the culminating thing that made him realize what kind of regime he was working for, the, the, the kind of position that he'd put himself in, that he really was in a Faustian bargain with this regime, that he couldn't get out of it, that he was in deep, and there was nothing he could do about it. In fact, it's an interesting thing that the, he went right out immediately after the arrest, and he went right back to being enormously energetic, committed, worked for the rocket program. I think he did that because he still believed in the technology. He was still a very nationalistic German. Therefore, he was fairly Nazified in his way of thinking, I think, considering some of the remarks he made after the war. And he also realized, in addition to all those things, that, that, that he had to put on a good show of being a very uh, loyal Nazi in order just to get to the end of the war and perhaps be able to surrender to somebody else. And so that's when I find, in fact, a number of reports of him showing up in SS uniform in places. Uh, he seemed to be, you know, on the one hand, and energetically and honestly working for the Reich, for the Army, for the missile, and on the other hand, putting on a kind of show of Nazi fanaticism for the benefit of, of, of protecting himself. Now, at the end of the war, of course, you know, this is another part of this story that's, that, that's so, so an amazing part of von Braun's career. He just so easily changed sides, you know, that it, it, it raises once again, just as all his other actions, you know, the specter of his is basically a political opportunism. It seemed like he would do anything just to work on rockets and he would sell his soul to almost anybody. But he certainly had in mind going to the United States and mostly through luck he was able to end up in the path of the U.S. Army. Excuse me. So he surrendered to the U.S. Army in the Bavarian Alps in May 1945 and uh, almost immediately the U.S. Army and other key members of uh, the uh, sort of scientific and, and military elite in, in, of the United States said, we could use these guys, you know, they're useful to us, maybe for the war against Japan, maybe, maybe for the long term. And so very quickly, uh, something that was called Project Overcast, but became more famous at Project Paperclip, to bring German scientists and engineers over to the United States uh, developed uh, in, inside the War Department and, and associated departments in the U.S. government. And he found himself in the United States at, with amazing speed. In, sep in September the 20th, 1945, he landed in, 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 on the east coast of the United States. And three weeks later, he was in El Paso, Texas, which was going to be the designated point for these German rocketeers. And another 120 of the German rocketeers from his group came over afterwards over the next six months and that little rocket group was formed under the US Army uh, in, in Texas. That was not the whole of Project Paperclip. There were actually several hundred more people uh, of other specializations that the Air Force, the Navy, and other agencies took. Now, because I've spent so much of my, my time on the German period, I think because the moral problem and the, the questions about concentration camp labor are so important, I'm going to have to kind of do, talk about his U.S. career in, in somewhat abbreviated fashion. Uh, and, and one, of course, one thing that happens is that he becomes very quickly a public figure. He, he's not only a a very persuasive manager, engineer, charismatic leader, technical uh, expert, but he becomes a public figure. That comes about because in the late 40s, as he's sitting in El Paso, Texas, and the missile program isn't very well funded because after the Cold War, we wanted to demobilize. We weren't that interested in building up a huge arms race with the Soviet Union yet, and we're pretty comfortable with our bomber deterrent. You know, so there wasn't much money in missiles. He had a lot of time on his hands, and he started to write a novel about going to Mars as a way to popularize the idea of space travel. 
The novel didn't work out. I mean, he did a lot of things wonderfully well, but writing fiction was not one of them. And the novel didn't work out, but it provided the foundation stone for then a, camp, a campaign of space advocacy that he made in the United States. So, you know, the first of the three sort of major accomplishments in the United States was selling the American public and by extension the Western public in, in large parts of the world, as a matter of fact, on the idea that space travel was real, that it could happen soon, that it wasn't just a crazy sort of uh, uh, cereal box, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon thing, uh, but that it had a real possibility of happening within a few years, certainly in less than a decade. And his great breakthrough was in 1952 with Collier's Magazine. There were space specials. There were several magazines came out with his articles in it. He became a famous person, followed immediately thereafter by Walt Disney uh, hiring him to become one of the chief uh, experts on three space programs, three space TV shows on the new Disneyland TV show. So those are broadcast in 1955, 1957, and also repeated many times throughout those years. Uh, so he became a famous person in, in selling the public and making the public believe that space flight was real. His second major accomplishment was the one that I mentioned at the beginning. That was becoming uh, one of the key people to, lay, to launching the first U.S. satellite after Sputnik. And of course, as, as I indicated, so you can read between the lines of what I had read, the, he had campaigned for a satellite project for years, but for two years before that, three years before that, but had been rebuffed. And the Navy project had been selected, but in the end, the Navy project failed to launch a satellite after Sputnik. He was given the green light to go ahead by the Defense Department on January the 31st, 1958, Explorer 1 was orbited by the U.S. Army group that he was so central in, in leading. And after that, there were several more space firsts. But of course, the last and final sort of major accomplishment in the United States was, was developing the Saturn rockets for the Apollo moon landing. Uh, and in, uh, in the late 50s, there was this inter-service struggle over who was going to control the space program, how it was going to be created. Eisenhower and then Lyndon Johnson, who was then majority leader, said we need a civilian space program and not just a military space program. NASA was created in 1958, and, uh, and in late 1959, von Braun's group was transferred over to NASA, never left Huntsville, Alabama. I guess I never remember to mention that he had moved to Huntsville, Alabama in 1950 with the Army. And in, in Huntsville, Alabama, that, they became the core of Marshall Space Flight Center. And the Marshall Space Flight Center developed the Saturn rockets, leading ultimately to this Saturn V, this monstrous vehicle. Of course, and you can see on the back cover of the book, the, the, just the five engines of the first stage of the Saturn V, this gigantic vehicle for launching the Apollo moon landing. So he had ultimately, although he was frustrated in his desire to travel into space personally and lead an expedition to the moon, he played a fundamental role in achieving his boyhood dream of, of the first human landing on the moon. Now, the aftermath of this achievement through the apogee of his life was disillusioning because, in fact, not long after we accomplished that feat, the American public said, we beat the Russians, been there, done that. We don't need to keep landing on the moon. Public it was, of course, as you many of you remember, in the, very much in the context of Vietnam, race riots, urban problems, poverty. Uh, people said, we've done that. We don't want to keep spending so much money on space. We want to spend it on something else. And we're mired in Vietnam, et cetera. And so the space program deteriorated very quickly. And somewhat in parallel to this, the Nazi problem started to creep back in. It, it was always there dogging him throughout his life. You know, he, throughout his, his fame in the 50s and the 60s, the question, what did you do, where were you, was there. And of course, he was subject to a uh, famous satire a song by Tom Lehrer. Uh, where the rockets go up, who cares where they come down? It's not my department, says Vanner von Braun. So, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was a subject of satire. The Nazi question was there, but he had kind of dodged this Nazi thing, dodged the Nazi bullet many, many times. Uh, 
The East Germans tried to get him. They tried to publicize his, his SS membership and his involvement with concentration camp labor. Didn't have much luck outside the Soviet bloc in having anyone pay attention to that. So the Nazi p problem comes creeping back in in the 60s and, and in the early 70s. But I think the real disappointment that followed the moon landing was the loss of interest in the public in, in a big space program. And within, uh, within five years, the Na NASA budget was effectively half of what it had been at its peak in the mid-60s. He went to Washington in 1970 uh, after having led the Marshall Space Flight Center for 10 years. He was, a, he was lured to Washington to become number four in NASA, uh, head of advanced planning. And at that point in time, advanced planning well, didn't have much of a future, and he found out there wasn't much of a future to plan. And all of the sort of uh, grandiose plans that NASA had rolled out for moon bases and space stations and Mars expeditions all went for naught, and the only thing that was developed was the space shuttle out of all that. And he quit NASA finally in spring of 1972 and went to Fairchild uh, Aircraft, which was uh, headquartered outside Washington. So he didn't leave Washington. He spent the last seven years of his life in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and that was a good job for him, but it didn't last very long because he developed cancer. The first time in 73, he got over that, but it came back in 75, and he died at age 65 in 1977. And still wi widely celebrated as a space hero and a space pioneer at his death, although with significant dissent from letter writers and others who said, don't forget, you know, he really was a Nazi. It was, it was seven years after his death, in 1984, that this whole thing really came back to haunt him, posthumously. Uh, and that was when Arthur Rudolph, who I mentioned earlier on, uh, who had been one of his key associates, in fact had been the pro project manager for the Saturn V launch vehicle, this gigantic vehicle that uh, was his, sort of the culmination of his life's work. Uh, Rudolph was forced to leave the United States, in fact voluntarily left the United States rather than contest a uh, denaturalization hearing over his involvement with concentration camp labor. And uh, when that news was uh, released in October 1984 by the Justice Department that Rudolph had left the country, had denounced his citizenship under this voluntary agreement, and uh, was uh, responsible for, for his involvement with war crimes. Uh, the floodgates opened up to all the information that had been successfully controlled or even uh, suppressed by the United States government. The Freedom of Information Act allowed journalists now, of course this is a post-Watergate world, allow journalists to, to get the uh, Army and other U.S. government agencies to give up information that had been sitting on regarding his SS membership, his party membership, and, and the whole story of Dora, which had been out there for years but somehow had not grabbed anyone's attention. And so in 1984-85, a lot of this information came out and his posthumous reputation has never been the same since. So, so in conclusion then, you know, I, I would say that you know, his, this, this Faustian bargain that he made with the Third Reich, this, 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 this thing that he had kind of walked into without paying much attention, without sleepwalked his way almost into this, 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 this bargain he made with the Third Reich, ultimately came back to haunt him, if mostly after his death and not in his lifetime. Um, and thus he will always remain, I think, some ways a symbol of the, the, the dilemmas and also the moral compromises of scientists and engineers in the 20th century. But yet at the end of all of this, I would have to say that I still couldn't deny him being probably the most influential and the most important rocket engineer and space advocate of the 20th century. There were several pioneers, including Herman Oberth, who were responsible for creating the idea that spaceflight was feasible, that rocketry was the way to go there. Um, but it was really the second generation of raw space enthusiasts who were involved in the rocket, who made this a reality. And the two most important were Vanna von Braun and in the Soviet Union, Sergei Pavlovich Kolyov. And, you know, in many ways, Kolyov had all, had all the big firsts. 
uh, he was the man who launched Sputnik and the first thing to hit the moon, the first thing to orbit the moon, the first uh, dog in space, the first man in space, the first woman in space, and on and on, a list of these great Soviet uh, firsts of the early part of the space race. But Karlyov ultimately started after World War II uh, by working with von Braun's technology because the Soviets decided to copy the V2. Von Braun's V2 was really the, was the most influential thing he did in his whole life because it led to both the ballistic missile development and to uh, space launch vehicle development in the United States, in the Soviet Union, in Britain, in France. There were other rocket groups, there were other influences or indigenous groups in the United States and the Soviet Union, but the V2 technology had been really fundamental in demonstrating that you could do this and also in influencing the state of the art and, and, and how rocketry developed. And of course, that one achievement of his was certainly the most influential thing he ever did. But it is a, it is a, you know, it is a surprising story that on top of that he managed to turn around, change sides, and develop an entire American career where he had at least three more major uh, accomplishments in development of spaceflight. So at the end of all this, I remain, you know, sort of I, a, a person I find to be morally dubious in some ways, but I cannot deny him his, his fundamental achievement in, in engineering and scientific terms. Thank you very much. So I guess there'll be a chance to ask questions, but uh, use the mic. Thank you. I've got everyone totally intimidated here. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a question. Yeah. No. Okay. How long did it take you to write the book? Could you? Could you? You want to use the mic? How long did it take you to write this book, Michael? Um, it was uh, a 10-year uh, project or a 20-year project, depending on how you count it. Uh, I, uh, as you know, I mentioned uh, in the, I think at the beginning of the book, I started originally doing this a long time ago, and then I decided uh, in, in 1987 I, was, I, I picked out this project, and I thought we really need a new biography of Fun Brown. There's nothing out there except hero worship, and and plus this new literature that came out after the Rudolph case, which was on the opposite extreme, kind of muckraking. But in the end, I decided that I really needed to write another book, and that was the Rocket and the Reich. And that book about the German V2 program came out in 95. And I kind of, resulting that, I shelved this project. And then in 1997, after I got through that and I'd and done a couple of other uh, projects, I said, I really have to do this. I still want to do this. So, so I started over in 1987, uh, 1997 with, uh, with, with the working on this project. Have access to anything more, any more materials than the previous von Braun biographies? I used a lot of things that were actually not available uh, to other people, or they simply hadn't used them. I mean, of course, this is part of the thing that when I started working on this project, I could see that what was lacking was someone who had the training in German history, uh, the, the, the academic foundation, as well as the language to really do it. So there was a lot of things that hadn't been done. Of course, a lot of them were some things that I did for the Rocket and the Reich that I reused. But then when it came to the biography, I found you know, there were enormous numbers of papers in the United States uh, that hadn't been used. Um, that it really, I think it's the nature of this topic that it did not seem to attract uh, biographers of the first rank. And it's an interesting comparison with, say, Oppenheimer, who has had many, many uh, good biographies written for uh, of him, and Knopf actually published one that won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, the American Prometheus. But there are many good books about Oppenheimer. Von Braun, however, I think suffered from this phenomenon that spaceflight was seen as kind of a pop topic uh, and was not taken as seriously. And he really needed uh, someone. I mean, I'm not the only person who could write a biography, but, it, but I was fortunate that, that I was able to gain access to many sources that would allow a much fuller picture of his life. Uh, when, um, 
when Von Braun was in the United States and sort of becoming a popular popularizer, if you will, mm -hmm. what was his reputation in Germany? Um, well, of course, you know, in Germany uh, was a divided country and from 1945 to 1989. And so he actually developed this in incredibly bifurcated reputation. In West Germany, he became a national hero. You know, of course, West Germany was our Germany. It was aligned with the West. Uh, and he was the local boy who makes good. So he was incredibly popular, especially in the after Sp uh, Explorer One, uh, after the, uh, that accomplishment, he was a national hero in the United States. But in this country, there were a lot of people who still had doubts, you know, for their own for own for good reasons about his past. In West Germany, you know, with the whole uh, uh, sort of sweeping under the rug the Nazi thing that was very typical at that time, uh, he was just a national hero. East Germans, of course, were on the uh, totally the opposite, and and uh, as I mentioned, they began to launch a campaign against him in the 60s to try to to out some of the uh, bad stuff in his past, in his Nazi past. So he was depicted as a villain. What the East German population thought is a good question because no one really knows how to figure that out. But we know that the Communist Party put a lot of effort into doing that, and it had influence. It, he, uh, a book that was published in 1963, The Secret of Huntsville, it was called in German, uh, which was written by a guy who was actually a Stasi officer, um, but a popular author, uh, was, I think, published, reached about one million copies in German, Russian, Polish, Hungarian. I mean, the Soviet bloc, they, 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 they spread this information around. And of course, it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, I don't want to go into this for too much, but why the Western media just completely ignored that story that was out there. I mean, it's not like the West Germans couldn't read what the East Germans were writing, but you know, it was too, all too easy to write everything off they did as communist propaganda, because in part it was, you know, it was freighted with heavy-handed jargon and 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 communist propaganda. Yeah, Michael. I, uh I have a question about ideology here. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated that by birth and by proclivity initially, uh, von Braun is somewhat of a conservative nationalist. Mm -hmm. And that he really wasn't overtly a Nazi, but it, because of opportunism, because of his desires to pursue his interests in, in rocketry, mm -hmm. moves into the Nazi party. But I'm wondering. Technology often has within its context ideology. In mm. other words, I'll give you an example from some another source that I'm thinking of. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, mm -hmm. the famous writer who wrote a, a, the Tarzan books, but also wrote about Mars, had a concept of science fiction. And within the concept of science fiction was the notion that uh, Americans and the, the America of his uh, era was lacking in virility, mm -hmm. and therefore he projected this need for virility onto Mars. And I'm wondering, within the context of von Braun's gadgetry and interest in rocketry, et cetera, et cetera, was there a conception of outer worlds as an alternative mm -hmm. place for, uh, you know, uh, Germans for the rest of the world as in some sort of either a utopian Mm -hmm. society or some, or was it, was it just purely exploration that he was interested in? Well, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an excellent question and I think uh, he wasn't very ideologically motivated throughout his whole life. He was kind of absorbed this conservative nationalist values kind of almost unthinkingly. It wasn't what he was interested in, but it was kind of natural for him and he didn't really think about it very hard. Uh, and the anti-communism that he absorbed from that, that context obviously served him well in changing sides. You know, um, the, uh, but as far as space travel is concerned, no, I don't, think he, he, I don't think he really was thinking very hard about colonization or what it meant. Because in fact, that could take very different forms. There's another uh, interesting example along the lines of what you said. Uh, uh, a Russian Bolshevik author wrote a novel before World War I that was essentially depict a communist utopia on Mars. So you project sort of your, what, what you wanted the world to be out there. Whereas von Braun, I think, really was interested fundamentally in exploration. But he was also driven by a kind of naive technological utopianism often. He, he seemed to have, have this, uh, 
um, and it showed up in his Mars novel and in some of the things that he wrote about in the 50s, kind of this assumption that, you know, if we had better technology, the world would just be a better place. And sooner or later, we would develop uh, technology for total comfort in daily life and, 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 and the world would be the world would be a utopia just from the development of science and technology. So I think he was sort of a naive enthusiast for science and technology throughout his whole life. This might, <clears throat> this might be a minute point, but I see it on the spine of your book. Was there mm -hmm. a, a, maybe a technological or other reason behind the checker, the black and white checkerboard? I, I think the, I think it's probably just a uh, design statement that the that the, the designer made. I mean, it does kind of look like, I've never thought of this before, like the black and white patterns on rockets that were painted in order to, so that you could see the movement and rotation when they're launched. But I think it's fundamentally the designer just like this black. Maybe, maybe the black and white statement is all connected to the book in the sense of, you know, Fun Brown can be depicted in black or in white as good guy or bad guy. That would, so on the V2? That wasn't his. That was already existent on other rockets. It wasn't. Well, his. in fact, they invented it for the V, uh, for the uh, v, uh, some of the early rockets before the V2, because they discovered that that when they were filming the launches, they couldn't see what this thing was doing unless they sort of essentially painted patterns on them, in order to see the movement of the vehicle as it was as it was ascending. Uh, so just initially, it was simply a test uh, uh, pattern. To, in order to be able to understand your data it was recorded on movie cameras. Could you talk a little bit about the failed novel? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the novel was called The Mars Project, and it was an interesting attempt by Fun Brown to popularize space travel. Uh, he had the idea which he got from the uh, Weimar period by other people that, well, how are we going to reach the people, you know, science fiction. Science fiction is the way to do this. And so uh, he conceived of a whole plan for rocket development leading to a landing on Mars. On paper, he made pages and pages and pages of calculations and planning. And then he wrote a novel to try to, you know, try to explain to the public how all that was going to work. Now the problem is, of course, this novel has got all these passages with uh, you know, boring interludes where somebody stands up and makes a long speech about rocket engine development or cosmic rays or, <laughs> you know. So, in fact, the book just got published just last end of last year. The, the Huntsville Space and Rocket Center, where a large part of his papers sit today, and which I only would have gotten into because I worked at the Air and Space Museum, uh, just published the novel last year. And it's a very interesting from a kind of analyzing his psyche and what he was obsessed with. But not, and it actually has these kind of sort of imaginative passages where he kind of imagines, and again, see, he imagines himself landing on Mars you know, that are actually pretty good, but then, you know, stuck in between is this thing. But, I mean, this is where, you know, from, from Al's preceding question, you know, this utopia that he projected on Mars is very interesting. He, he sort of depicted a, a world of Percival Lowell, you know, canals on Mars, a dying, a dying planet. Civilization had built the canals to bring water to the cities and the poles. And, and this Martian civilization that he depicted in the book was very much kind of a technological utopia, where science and technology had fixed everything, you know. Was, mm -hmm. it, trans was it translated into English? Well, it was translated into English originally at the time, because he wrote it off Deutsch. And then, because, I, you know, it was 1948, and that was his native language, and he was just getting used to doing English. So he wrote it in German, and then a friend of his mother's, who was fluently bilingual, translated it into English. And he tried to, you know, flog it in New York. He sent it to, he said 18 publishers in New York rejected it. So, oh. <laughs> so, so it, it ended up a failure. Now there's an interesting aftermath to this. The, the, the mathematical appendix was published as the Mars Project and, uh, and appeared in 1952 in German and 1953 in English. And then a German rewrote the entire novel and published it in German. But he thought it was so badly screwed up when he rewrote it, he 
disowned it, and it was published under the other guy's name. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there are all kinds of interesting details to that. Hi. Dr. Strange Love again. Mm hmm. And right. I, I wondered if you've given any thought to whether he's the model for Dr. Strange Love. Well, you know, that uh, question has been raised from the very beginning of, of, the, of the movie. And, and uh, one of the funny little things that I found when I was doing research was that the New York Review of Books, which has been like, this was only like issue two or something, ran this rapturous review of, of uh, Dr. Strangelove. And in it, the uh, author speculated that it was a composite of Herman Kahn, Werner von Braun, and, and Edward Teller. And those who remain today the three favorite candidates for the model for Dr. Strangelove. And they, the, 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 the New York Review of Books mailed it to von Braun's office and said, you might be interested in reading this. And I'm not in, I'm not, it's not clear that his, his public affairs guy ever showed it to him. But right from the outset, that speculation was there. And uh, there are a lot of schools of thought. But, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, Fred Kaplan in the New York Times a couple of years back published a very, I think, convincing case that the fundamental uh, caricature behind this is Herman Kahn. Because of Kahn had published on thermonuclear war, and, and there was a popular controversy over this, and the whole idea of nuclear strategy and doomsday gap and all of this. But at the end, you still have to say the Nazi part of strange love had to have come from von Braun, because those other guys were Jewish. I mean, Ki Kissinger was another candidate. Kahn, Kissinger, uh, and, and Teller, they're all Jewish. And, the, and you know, and of course, uh, um, uh, strange love has that Nazi outburst in, in the war room. You know, mein Führer, I can walk. Um, um, and in fact, uh, there's an interesting anecdote to that. Arthur C. Clarke, who was a good close friend of von Braun, uh, had uh, start, begun working with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, was the next movie after Dr. Strangelove. And, and Kubrick told Clark, tell Vanner I wasn't getting at him. And, and Clark's comment in his autobiography is, I didn't because A, I didn't believe it, and B, even if Stanley wasn't, uh, Peter Sellers certainly was. So, uh, you know. So yes, I think he was part of a composite of Dr. Strangelove. In indeed, thanks for coming out on this rainy night. We turned on the weather forecast and said it rained inches and inches out there. Um, and thanks for C-SPAN for coming too. Um, I, uh, exactly one week ago to, uh, today was, of course, the 50th anniversary of Sputnik, the, the uh, first satellite to orbit the Earth. And I wanted to begin just by reading the beginning of a chapter, which is um, what happened to von Braun on the night that, that, that Sputnik was announced. Late on the afternoon of Friday, 4 October 1957, just 15 years and one day after the first successful V-2 launch in Peenemünde, Werner von Braun went back to his Huntsville office. There was to be a brief interlude before cocktails and dinner at the officers' club. Together with General Medeiros, he had been showing the newly nominated defense secretary, Neil McElroy, and Army Secretary Brooker around Redstone Arsenal all day. The phone, telephone rang. It was a British newspaper man calling from New York. What do you think of it? He asked. Think of what? The Russian satellite, the one they just orbited. I wasn't surprised, von Braun later said. I'd long known that the Russians had a satellite capability. I was just disappointed and a little bitter that we hadn't been allowed to do it before they did. When von Braun reached the party, he sought out McElroy and Medeiros. As he recalled the moment a few months later, he exclaimed, if you go back to Washington tomorrow, Mr. Secretary, and find that all hell has broken loose, remember this. We can get up a satellite in 60 days. Medeiros' 1960 memoir is more dramatic, based it is on a surprise announcement by his public relations chief, Gordon Harris, who was not even at the party. Perhaps the bearer of bad news was von Braun himself. There was a moment of stunned silence. Then von Braun began to talk as if he'd been suddenly been vaccinated with a Victrola needle. In his driving urgency to unburden his feelings, his words tumbled over one another. We knew they were going to do it. Vanguard will never make it. We have the hardware on the shelf. For God's sake, 
Turn us loose and let us do something. We can put up a satellite in 60 days, Mr. McElroy. Just give us a green light and 60 days. Medeiros finally interjected, no, Werner, 90 days. The launch of Sputnik, Russian for satellite or fellow traveler, was one of the defining moments in Werner von Braun's life and one of his greatest disappointments. It stirred in him a boiling mix of emotions, frustration at two years of official setbacks for his satellite project, annoyance and depression at the propaganda harvest reaped by Khrushchev, jubilation at the prospect of finally being released from restraints, and hope in man. And another, a couple years later, described him as handsome as a film star and he knows it. So, uh, so you know, he had this winning way, this, this, this charisma, he had, he had the drive, he also had the ability, so that uh, in, in maths and sciences, uh, and this led him on very rapidly into a career from rather under small beginnings. In 1932, when he was still a student and working for a small uh, amateur rocket group in Berlin, the army came looking at what this amateur rocket group was doing, wasn't very interested in what they had accomplished, wasn't very impressed, but they were impressed by Werner von Braun. He was, he was obviously talented, obviously had the prospect for the future, and they, they sort of asked him towards the end of 1932, and of course you remember this is before Hitler comes to power, just before it's in the context of catastrophic political conditions in Germany, massive unemployment, street battles between the Nazis and the communists. The government was unstable, and in fact, his father, in his very last two governments before Hitler came to power, was the Minister of Agriculture for, for, for Germany uh, in these last reactionary cabinets before Hitler came to power. The army said, come over to us, we'll uh, finance your dissertation research, we'll move you into physics, at the University of Berlin and will finance your s secret rocket work if you just come and work for us. And that sounded like a pretty, it was a very good deal to him. He said, at least with hindsight he said, but perhaps at the time, you know, I knew very well that the amateur rocket business was just t making toys and the only real hope for future large scale rocketry for space flight was going with the military, going with the army. For the family, I think, being hired by the army was in fact a great asset because it legitimized what seemed like a rather flaky, you know, uh, crackpot almost act, uh, enthusiasm that he had for this technology, although his mother had been very encouraging. His father was just kind of mystified by it all. Um, but uh, the army legitimized for him, for the relatives, his working in rocketry. And then right after that happened, Hitler came to power. Two months after he started with the army, in Jan at the end of January 33, Hitler came into power. And then, you know, of course, it wasn't an instantaneous change, but within a few months, they had the Nazis had successfully subverted the Constitution and destroyed the other parties. And, you know, as far as I can tell, von Braun was really indifferent to all this. He said at the time he didn't really notice anything about it. Uh, except that his father lost his job. His father was out of the job as agriculture minister when the Hitler cabinet came in and they had to move out of the minister's residence but beyond that he didn't seem to care and I think part of this is that he was so obsessed with rocketry and space flight that that was the only thing he truly cared about. But he also came out of this conservative nationalist context, a conservative nationalist family and you know for the, the, the Nazis started out one of the ways to consolidate power was by making an alliance with a conservative nationalist faction in Germany, um, in the aristocracy, in big business, in the army, and then proceeding and, and, and represented themselves as representing German values and then proceeded to shove those people out of the way once they could seize power solely for themselves. But uh, for von Braun, he was, in the, he was working for the army, at first just as a graduate student, but, but money started coming in, of course, rearmament, first secretly on a small scale, then increasingly on a large scale, money came pouring in and, and he was financed more and more. And he was also very successful, very small scale in the rocket development, but very rapidly it grew. And in fact, within five years, this is really astonishing, but within five years, you know, in the context of this massive rearmament buildup, the Army decided along with the Air Force to build a whole new rocket center on the Baltic coast at Peenemunde. And, and although he, had, he was only 25 years old in 1920, uh, 1937, he uh, was already in command of 400 people. 
because he had this talent. I mean, this is where, in the context of building up this rocket program and then building up Peña Munda, you know, they, which itself grew by a factor of 10 or more over the next few years, he demonstrated that his fundamental talent was the management of huge technological groups of engineering management. As a scientist, as an engineer, he was no better than a lot of others, but as an engineering manager, he was spectacularly successful. And, you know, of course, one of the feature, features that this book makes much of is the Faustian bargain, because in effect, von Braun kind of sleepwalked into a Faustian bargain with the Third Reich. And, 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 and almost more than many scientists and engineers of the 20th century, this Faustian bargain was absolutely the best metaphor for what happened to him. Because he, you know, the money was coming in, he had more power, he had more resources, his, his rocket program was building up, you know, the, the, the I guess this was part of, certainly part of his in, innate personality, the way that he, the way he's motivated himself is that he decided he had to have a life's work and that he would have an enormous ambition. And his enormous ambition by the age of 16 was to land on the moon, to actually go into space, to lead a space expedition. He said to the New Yorker in 1951, a very fa a fascinating profile that I feature at the beginning of the book in the prologue, he said, you know, I read this article in an astronomy magazine about an imaginary trip to the moon. It filled me with romantic urge not just to stare at the moon and the planets, but to actually go there. I knew how Columbus had felt, he said. And so he, he had this, uh, this incredible ambition. And of course, you have to remember, this is 1928, and he's thinking about expeditions into space and leading an expedition into space. And that motivated him, because he'd been a very kind of indifferent student or a lazy student in some ways, motivated him to study his worst subjects, which happened to be math and physics mostly because he just hadn't been been interested before but now he was fascinated with that and very r rapidly developed into a kind of prodigy although a late prodigy only at the very kind of end of his high school years and he uh, he had been in uh, boarding school because his parents had to ship him off because regular education just didn't work for him now he you know i think some point at this time in the late 20s of the era, the beginning of the 30s, I think he really must have discovered himself that, that he had this incredible, not just ambition, but also this incredible talent for winning people over. He was just astoundingly charismatic. I mean, as people who have met him personally told me that too, and it's repeated over, over time. It's hard to explain, but he was incredibly charming. Uh, he was very, he was, he was, he, he could be completely down to earth or he'd be extremely uh, uh, cultured and polite. Uh, he was incredibly good looking. Uh, he was a golden boy. You know, he was one of these golden youths who looked wonderful and everything came easy to him. Um, he, uh, you know, he was, he, he, in the 1930s, when, by the time he was in his 20s, he certainly became quite a, a ladies man. Uh, or, or if you if you prefer a womanizer, but certainly he was extremely successful with the opposite sex. And there are two descriptions of him from after World War II by British correspondents that stick in my mind. One of them described him right after the end of the war as a blue-eyed blonde, the Nazi artist picture of the perfect Aryan that Sputnik would shock the United States into pursuing an energetic space program. Quite suddenly. The space age, as the press almost instantly dubbed it, had dawned, and von Braun was its prophet. Within four months after the launch of the first U.S. satellite, he was a bona fide American hero, the Western world's most prominent gladiator in a celestial contest with the Soviets. Now, of course, this fame was rather extraordinary because, of course, he was an ex-Nazi. He had come here from Germany. He had worked for the Third Reich. And uh, and, and then he became a very, very famous American. And so I guess the, one of the questions of this book is, how was this possible? How was that this former member of, of the Nazi party, how could he have become such a famous American? What role did he play in the United States? And to do that, of course, we sort of need to go back to the beginning and understand who he was and how he, how he became a, uh, a, a, an important person in Germany first. Now, his background was... Uh, was pure Prussian uh, Junker. 
uh, uh, Eastern European aristocracy. He was actually a baron. He was born in 1912. He inherited the title of baron. Uh, he was, grew up in a very conservative nationalistic family, uh, sort of a very traditional Prussian aristocracy. Uh, many of his relatives had been army officers. Uh, his grandfather, his uncles, his father had been a reserve officer, a very typical thing, of course, for the Prussian aristocracy. Uh, he had been raised in this very traditional family, yet somehow in his, not in, in his uh, middle years of his childhood, he became a spaceflight fanatic, and he ended up doing something very unusual for a member of his class, becoming an engineer and a, tech, and a technical person. Uh, the spaceflight obsession that really drove him throughout his life was something that he developed between the ages of 14 and 16, therefore in the mid-1920s. Um, he dis this was the moment in which new ideas of the feasibility of space travel had been published by a few theoreticians. Uh, in the German-speaking world, Hermann Obert was very important for establishing that rockets really could carry things into space, that we could build this technology, that it wasn't just a fantasy, it wasn't just science fiction, maybe it was a few decades away, but it seemed to be coming soon. And of course, for a teenager who was already very interested in astronomy, this idea of traveling in space was, was, was fascinating. Uh, and he soon developed an, an incredible ambition